corporate entrepreneurship in finance and banking. And we're really lucky to have Dr. Kanan Shirni Nasan, who's the H.J. Hines Professor of Management, Marketing and Business Technology at Tepper. You know, I went through his list of publications and it, it's really eye-opening both in the breadth and depth of what he's put together. And when I think about his academic background, he has a BA in engineering uh, from the University of Madras, an MBA in marketing finance, and a PhD from UCLA in management. So um, I think he's put together a great panel for us today and really looking forward to learning more about corporate entrepreneurship in finance and marketing. So Kanan, let me throw it over to you. We've got the panelists, Laura, uh, Sean, Michael. We have only 45 minutes and I think that it's a wonderful panel and I'm sure you're all excited to hear from them. You know, I'm sure you've had a chance to look at the background of the panelists. I would still ask them to give a very brief introduction about themselves and then we'll kick off the panel. What's impressive about the panel is they are on the very front end of what this panel is uh, all about. These are people on a daily basis are looking at the next generation of innovation that's happening in the top financial institutions. Hi, I'm Laura, I'm CEO at Numo. And quick by way of background for me, I'm a biomed engineer by undergrad degree that started working in spy satellites that moved into banking. And now I'm CEO at a FinTech incubator for a bank. So I had a really logical career path progression from my undergrad degree to where I am today. <laughs> so that's awesome. my quick intro. Oh, hi, uh, this is Michael Lee. I work for uh, a Quant group in the global markets division of uh, Bank of America. Collectively, we basically serve as a sales side uh, service firm that you know sales and do sales and trading for on securities and derivative products uh, for our institutional clients. Yeah, I also sit on a few innovation forums within the bank, some focus on technology, some focus on business, some focus on quantitative modeling. Very excited to be here and I'm happy to share my perspectives. Hi, so I'm Sean Mahotra. Uh, so I'm the head of engineering at Thomson Reuters. Uh, so I lead kind of all, all of our product development across the organization. Um, so we've got about 3000 engineers worldwide who are building products primarily to serve financial institutions, but uh, legal professionals, tax professionals, and, and other parts of corporations. Been at Sierra for four and a half years. And, you know, like Laura, I had a very logical career path as I used to work on compilers for semiconductors and then switched into this. So very, very natural career path there too. Thank you so much. Without much ado, I would straight away jump into some questions I had for this panel. And I think that we are going to learn from that. Technology is fundamentally changing everything and specifically financial institutions. You know, algorithmic uh, loan approvals, we have got uh, robotic advisors. And so in a number of ways, technology is kind of penetrating into areas outside of the algorithmic trading. Now, how do you see this? If you kind of look out in the next 24 to 48 months, how is this going to impact the financial institutions? Is this the dawn where the machines are going to replace or substitute for humans much more than financial institutions. Uh, Michael, I think your experience in this area is very directly relevant. So I would like you to kind of share your thoughts and I'm sure Sean and Laura also have a lot to add to that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I would, there are probably many different themes of innovation and technology kind of transformation in, in the financial industry. I would like to just maybe focus on one of one of the themes, which is I think that the broad use of machine learning and AI techniques across everything almost we do, which is manifested in terms of the product and services that the client can directly interact with, uh, some robot advisor and uh, you know virtual uh, financial assistance uh, in the mobile banking application, for, for example, but also internally as uh, how we work and how we process, uh, do our daily uh, processes. For, for example, it's widely known that we use machine learning for fraud detection and anti-money laundry, uh, you know, know your customer type of analysis, uh, basically uh, sensing through a massive amount of data, which is not necessarily very organized to begin with. So machine learning is, is very productive in that, in that space. Uh, since I work uh, myself or work in the, in the quant team in the global markets, basically trading area, I like to focus a little bit about what we see, uh, how we use machine learning and AI techniques uh, these days. I think traditionally the quant team, we focus on the basic asset pricing for all these bonds and derivatives and, uh, and the complex portfolios. 
In recent years, I think a new stream of work has been emerged uh, in terms of electronic trading and using AI models to automate or augment human in speeding up the way we conduct uh, transactions and, and price the securities uh, in a larger volume and, and faster speeds. In particular, I, I think I'd like to mention one of the products that I feel very proud of that is kind of created by, by my own team inside the bank is widely adopted and, and widely viewed as one of the most innovative products within, within the bank itself. It, unfortunately, it's not you know, visible externally, but I think internally has got a lot of recognition in terms of innovation. Um, what it does is actually concept is very simple. It basically uh, put data analytics and visualization capabilities in one platform. And it creates a ecosystem or community, if you will, much like the YouTube as an analogy. So giving these data and these capabilities, the content creators, which are basically the sales and trading and research and uh, you know, the quant team themselves, uh, that they, they can use this platform to curate the way, the best ways of identifying, you know, the trends and patterns and the market dislocation, relative value, or even trading strategies all within the same platform. Not only that they can do it for themselves, but also once they are happy with their, the, the way they look at the market, they actually can share that with their colleagues and, uh, or even the entire organization. So this creates a, a basically a, a self-sustaining or, or you know, crowdsourcing environment, if you will, unlike most uh, traditional way in the bank has been, you know, the quant team, the technology team build an application and push the features and the capabilities into the end user. Now we're kind of putting it back, we're letting the users to curate the contents and modify them as they go on the fly. So that's one distinct feature. The other one is that, you know, maybe using the analogy of, you know, flying a Boeing 747 where you have hundreds of dials in, in the cockpit, whereas the, the modern F-22 Raptor, for example, fighter jet, you have none of that. You basically have a goggle and you see through that. And then most importantly, it, it flags you on important things you should pay attention to. So what we call it is basically signal-based trading. The platform allows the end user to curate the way they want to alert, be alerted. Uh, these signals can be defined as simple as time series analysis or as complex as you know machine learning based models but it's random forest or even even neural network so they have this tool at their fingertip to create the signals that prompt themselves you know when uh, when something happens that's important for them to look at and again these signals can be shared across with their, their colleagues and, and peers so this is something I, I feel like it's, a, it's a quite innovative in the sense that it becomes not just a single team that's producing the intelligence. It's really the whole collectively, the, the whole uh, organization is doing that uh, and helping each other. So I'll probably start from there. I'm sure my colleagues have uh, other perspective to share. That's, that's, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, it's impressive. Uh, Michael has actually had built one of these inside the one of the leading financial institutions in the country. Sean, do you have any thoughts on it? Would you be able to add to that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Michael said and, and kind of pick up on a few things there. I think a key word he used was augment, right? Is is we we talk a lot about, you know, robotic processes and AI and ML replacing humans. But I think what I've seen both in financial institutions, but other markets we serve, again, like legal professionals and tax professionals, is it allows subject matter experts to kind of have a more powerful automation is one thing that those technologies allow so that they can focus more of their time on things that require their unique expertise, whether that be serving their end customers or solving more complex sort of problem. And the other thing it does is, you know, the other example he gave with, with fighter jet, right, is it gives you signals. Is it's not going to automatically get you the answer, but in a world where we're all drowning in information and signals coming from everywhere, to be able to say, you know, we have a, we have a product that we sell to, to government institutions to help them detect potential fraud in, in public programs. And it's not gonna tell you there is fraud going on here, you should deny this claim, right? That's not something we can confidently do. And there's in a highly regulated environment, it's not something we're gonna do in the foreseeable future. However, what it can do is say, when you're spending your valuable time investigating, you might wanna start here because there's some strange things in the signal here that are worth looking into. So it helps you prioritize your time. So I see a lot of these technologies where we're at today in the state of the art is it's helping these professionals be more efficient at their job, prioritize their time more effectively, and spend more of their hours leveraging their unique subject matter expertise rather than kind of doing things that can be automatable or you know are not a good use of their time. Wonderful. 
Lara, given your experience uh, within your financial institution, how do you see this? Yeah, I think, uh, so as a caveat for folks, I said I'm COO of NUMO. NUMO is um, a wholly owned subsidiary of PNC Bank. So I want to explain that when I go into my next example that, that we're owned by PNC. I agree, Sean, it was funny. You said augment was the word. I literally wrote on a post-it note when Michael was talking <laughs> augment, because I think that is actually really key to hear that it's not replacing. It's not um, going to just stand off on its own. I think it's the augmentation of of humans and what we can do. PNC just announced it just hit payments.com um, today, actually, the launch of Pin Pinnacle Cash Flow Forecasting, um, which is um, AI and machine learning, where they're trying to help businesses better understand cash flow because it's very difficult to predict and everything. And what I found most interesting about what they were doing is it's tagging into like their ERP systems, their banking data, it's looking at everything to use technology to predict it. But what is, I think, an interesting play on it is that when you play, the customer can actually use their own measures that they want to do for the prediction, but then it remembers the prediction that it made. And then so in time, when they go back, it replays and says, was this accurate? So not only is it helping them predict what's going to happen, but 90 days later, the model will go back and say to the person, hey, this is what we predicted based on the parameters you said, did that actually happen? Uh -huh. And so the machine will learn over time, but it's also being really transparent to the business themselves about, is it accurate so far or not? And I think that that's a, a really interesting thing to enable businesses to make better decisions um, going forward of, of how they're going to work, how their cash flow will work, et cetera. Oh, that's really interesting. For the uh, broader set of participants, uh, some of you might have heard about reinforcement learning, uh, which kind of dynamically learns and adjust in machine learning. That's an important area. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting work going around uh, CMU where we are comparing various methods, including reinforcement learning. Thank you. Uh, let me just jump off to the you know, second set of issue, which I think is probably considerable importance in the entire space. Fintech, as you can, uh, you know, by the time you say the word fintech in Silicon Valley, somebody is ready to write the check for you to start a company. And there is this, uh, Lara is kind of smiling. Uh, in fact, Numo was a part of the, part of the uh, impetus for starting Numo was they figured out as to how much they have to pay for those fintechs if they weren't a small piece of any of the fintech company. And then it occurred to them that that money might be more wisely used for an internal incubator. So the question here is that, of fintech and some of them like Robin Hood have done extremely well and uh, a number of fintech companies are coming uh, coming out in this space. How do you see the competition emerging between uh, fintech and uh, you know well-established financial institutions? And Lara is in the middle of that. Uh, she She's literally on both sides of the equation so I thought it would be great to kick it off this question with Lara. Yes, yeah, so I'll start with kind of explaining what, what NUMO is and the idea behind NUMO and it, it's kind of exactly what Kanan said who was Part of the early stage thinking on NUMO as well. So he knows quite a bit about us. What was an interesting concept is Dave, who is our CEO, was saying that, you know, these smaller startups have their own advantages. Legacy banks and institutions have their own advantages, but they also have their flaws as well. And how can you take the best of both of those worlds? So how can you take the kind of industry like trust that like a bank would have of like with the financial data, kind of the large number of customers or relationships they have, but it's negative is the legacy infrastructure, right? It's slow, it just moves so slow to try to do anything or make any change, it, it's slow. And then on the startup side, it's the opposite. It can move super fast. It can be in new tech stacks. They just move and they're really nimble, but they maybe don't have that reputation. So it's a little bit harder for them to establish or grow. So how can you combine those two worlds? And that is NUMO. Um, and that's the concept of it. So when I think about how these two worlds are merging, I look at it from a bit of kind of two angles. One, um, as a bank, it's about partnership with them. The banks have to partner with the fintechs. We can't pretend that we can't. Um, and so I think in the beginning, we didn't even maybe consider them like five, seven years ago that they were big challengers to us or anything. I think it's becoming really clear that they are. And so I think part of it is around partnership and how the banks can work with them, not push them away. I think the other piece of it is how do we learn from them? Uh, they do move faster. And I think where it hurts the bank often is it's not that they don't have really smart people, really great ideas or concepts around products. It's that it takes them forever to deliver it based on kind of the architecture that they have, maybe the governance and risk structure they have around it, where it could be a fintech to launch a new product idea in the market in 12 months. A bank may take three years, four years, five years to do the exact same thing at scale just because of how it's structured. So for us at NUMA, we're really trying to spend a lot of time learning 
um, from how fintechs are able to, to do that so fast and just do that. Um, I think the last piece, and when we were doing a prep call, I, I mentioned this, that I think is just really interesting. When I look at fintechs, what you see is most of them are doing pieces um, of like kind of microservices. They get really good at one specific thing, whereas a bank is offering end-to-end -end products. And so that will always be kind of our advantages is we're doing something holistically across like entire kind of banking relationship of a customer where a lot of the fintechs that we would partner with focus on one thing, whether it be specifically on payments, whether it may be invoicing or, or whatever it may be, the fintechs tend to have a specialty, but because they specialize, they do it better than basically anybody else. And I think that that's the other piece where we can learn from them and partner with them. Sean, how do you see fintechs uh, from where you're sitting? Yeah, so I think the, the partnership is the key part there, right, is I think Laura hit a lot of the great points and that the pros and cons that large organizations and smaller startups kind of bring to the table. And I think that if I look at more broad kind of technology trends and things that we're really embracing across our portfolio, you know, I've, I've had the luxury of kind of seeing multiple industries, right? So I see the financial industry, the legal industry, the tax industry. And what's interesting is that they're all kind of following one another just with like a time constant lag, right, is I think Financial institutions, I think, are ahead of where law firms and tax firms are kind of going to, but they're all following the same basic pattern. And what I'm seeing emerge now in places like legal and tax is more of a push towards openness. That if you're a larger company who has the end-to-end -end solution, how do you start to create infrastructure that enables APIs and that allows others to kind of plug into what you're building so that that one niche player who solves a specific customer's problem really, really well, that might not be a market big enough for us to kind of go and make a good investment in, how do we let them plug into our broader ecosystem so that that customer gets the end-to-end -end solution and allows us to plug and play? So I think that partnership's key. And I think, again, all, all the industries that, that we serve are, again, also very highly regulated. So I think that trust and that ability to know that um, you know, a, a large company who's kind of done this before stands behind what's happening and has kind of vetted it um, is really important to our customers as well, right? Because you can't take risks that, that maybe a smaller company could on their own. So I think that partnership and kind of being being the glue who brings the ecosystem together is a great way for, for the two to work together. Wonderful. Wonderful. Michael, you are sitting in one of the premier financial institutions. Do you see it the same way? Yeah, I thought of two uh, positive aspects and uh, one real concern as well. So on the positive side, I think it's largely overlapping with uh, what Sean and Laura have described. On the one side, you know, fintech companies do certain things better. And, and, and it's true that the large banks somehow just don't get it. And, and like payments, for, for example. But my point in that is that it's okay. The, the financial service industry is not literally a zero-sum game. It's not like they do better and we're hurting in that process. So collectively, we're making a richer and more you know, better served experience for, for our clients. So that's so the, the pie can actually grow. Much like uh, what I remind me of Microsoft, it's being challenged. They, they just can't get a lot of things right. But nevertheless, they, they became the largest company in the world in a few, few days ago in terms of market cap. And so, so is banking so far. I think the most of the major banks have been producing record revenues even after all these you know, crises and uh, challenges and disruption from fintechs. Um, so, so far we're in a good shape. On the other hand, in terms of partnership, I totally agree with that. Uh, in addition to partnership, we also see banks also see them as clients. You know, we helped, uh, we actually, and investment uh, targets, we actually identify, deliberately spend efforts in, in identifying the most pro promising fintech startups. Kind of we invest in them, we help them vet their products and services because we're actually their early adoption of their products and services, providing some early revenues. And, and when they get acquired or when IPO, we actually benefit from, from that initial investment as well. So it's not just partnership, but they're also our clients. What I'm really concerned though is actually the DeFi space which uh, probably belongs to a different topic, but my feeling is that it different from all of the other small startups, if you will, that they challenge that this paradigm fundamentally challenges the very nature of why bank exists from saving, from lending, from borrowing, even from trading, insurance, everything they, they everything that you do in the traditional financial service space now can actually be replicated in the decentralized environment. So I, I feel that is, uh, is, is a fundamental threat and it has to be handled properly. Mm, wonderful. Uh, that's a great thought. And we will, in our time permitting, we'll certainly talk more about DeFi and I'm sure Michael will be able to add to that. Very quickly, I think before I jump onto the uh, next question, 
I just wanted to quickly talk about, uh, you know, the corporate startup lab that's, you know, Sean's passion, Sean Andrade's passion is also partly to bridge this gap whether traditional institutions can operate in an environment that really accelerates new product introductions, the type of constraints that Laura and Michael were specifically talking about. And uh, also at the same time, uh, take them out of their current ecosystem and bring them into the university ecosystem. Or the university ecosystem also pull in the latest uh, you know, frontier research that we are doing and integrate it directly into that process. So it's kind of an exciting model and Sean is doing it with tremendous passion. And uh, Sean and Dave have done wonderful work uh, in this area. And I think I'm very optimistic as to where CMU is going to be uh, and incredibly supportive of this. The next one I'm uh, really looking at, and, and it's probably uh, goes to Sean uh, because Thompson Writers is one of the preeminent uh, data sources. There are a number of interesting next generation of investing models that's happening. Right. I mean, the most uh, prominent one is the way they kind of went after some charts based on uh, collaboratively attacking on Reddit, right? Uh, it's kind of virtual. I don't know if this is the early version of Metaverse or not, but, you know, it's kind of the virtual world. They collaborated, you know, people who didn't know each other kind of gotten banded together. And uh, normally you wouldn't think about these small customers going after big hedge funds, but actually made some of the big hedge funds to cover their positions and so on and so forth. Are we, is this the, is this a fad or is this the beginning of potentially a next generation of various interesting sources of information that could be used for investment? I think it's a pattern that applies to investing. It applies in all kinds of facets of our life. I think the proliferation of data and the proliferation of tools and technologies that make it easy to, to process big data, to run analytics on big data. It's not a new concept, but it's a concept that's really been amplified, partly because of those tools, but partly because digitization has just created so much data for, for us to kind of leverage. And personally, I feel like, I do think we're, we're at a fundamental change, right? Where gone are the days where you, if you have a proprietary data set, um, you sit on it, you have a unique advantage that nobody else can replicate. Um, there are companies who will try to do that, and it's it's hard to do to kind of create that silo. But more and more where I see things going is you have these economies of data now, right, where people who sit on valuable data are realizing that unlocking it and sharing it with people who want to build on top of that um, can do great things. And I think anytime you, if you think about disruptions that we have in technology, you know, I always give the example of if you think about something like Uber, you know, if you didn't have something like Google Maps or like map-based kind of APIs in the past, could you really have an Uber kind of getting off, off the ground when it started with, right? And probably not. No. But you don't build the maps database and that data with the intention of creating Uber, right? It's just you build a valuable data set and then the ecosystem, the technology ecosystem figures out what are some creative things I can do with this. Now, sometimes those creative things are quite disruptive as we saw with the, with the Reddit kind of short, short gaming and, and that. But look, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm fairly, I'm on the side that I think is inevitable, which is that Sources of data are going to get cleaned, published, and put out there. People are then going to be using modern technology tools and their creativity to figure out what to do with it. And in some ways, I see it as a massive equalizer where you've democratized kind of some of that innovation. And sometimes it's going to lead to very positive outcomes. Sometimes it's going to lead to disruptive things. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, I, I think one thing that's very interesting to me is that as this all flourishes, again, because we serve legal professionals, regulatory compliance professionals, and these sorts of things as well, it's imperative that our regulatory standards and our legal professionals are also able to keep up with that pace, right? Because otherwise you, you end up kind of creating oversight and governance for a world that doesn't exist anymore. And so sometimes that innovation will be disruptive and you have to correct. Sometimes it'll be disruptive in, an, in only a positive way, but I do think it's here to stay. Laura, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just a, a, a couple. One, when I think the Uber example is a great example. One of the ones that's kind of similar that I'll go to sometimes is, is Amazon, right? Where it's a little bit backwards. So they, you know, AWS happened because they were serving their own need and then we're like, holy crap, <laughs> we can make a lot of money here. And now it's off using for other purposes. But I think to make an like kind of going into another area that I think is interesting with the data is the Reddit example, right? Where you see where like on social forums where, where folks are able to have access to that data, then publish things and then have basically a group of people go and like mass influence, you know, stock prices and the markets and manipulate that. And I think that that's a, a really interesting space to understand how do we as financial institutions handle that when those aren't regulated, there's nothing that can be done in that space where there are these temporary highs or lows associated with folks doing it that don't last long-term, but cause the spike. And how do you educate people who are getting in on that 
that may think, oh my gosh, this thing is going to get rich and they don't have a lot of money and they invest in it, right? And then, and now they've lost money because of a Reddit thread that they saw a pattern and a trend of something spiking up thinking, this is my thing. And I think that that's an interesting thing that to kind of watch and see. I don't know how we respond to it quite yet, but that was kind of my thoughts when you when you brought that up. I think it's an interesting space. Michael? Yeah, uh, I think my views are quite similar. As Shaw indicated that uh, I do agree that it's inevitable. It's here to stay in one form or the other. From a technical point of view, I guess it's basically enabled through by technology, by these kind of commission-free trading platform like Robinhood to allow people to kind of collectively operate uh, whatever that is. It could be, you know, the Uber is one example. Maybe another example in my head is really the, the social aspect. It really, it's similar to the social media taking over or challenging the, the, the media stat, uh, status quo establishment, if you will. I think it appears that individuals now have more and more voice through technology and through the democracy process. That is one way or other here to stay. And um, maybe deliberately trying to take the liberals end of the argument just for the fun of it is that in the short term, it definitely created disruptions to, to the market and then introduced the unnecessary volatilities or artificial volatilities, if you will. But on the other hand, you could argue that among these you know, group of people, there are people who are probably, you know, not so educated, not so well informed, or potentially even evil intended. But hopefully over time, I would like to see that, that force emerge into a positive term that's called a collective wisdom. I think if you look back, at, you know, the, the GameStop and the AMC, uh, which is the starting of the mem stock, if you will, looking back, and they did take advantage of the, you know, overselling, overshorting of for certain stocks and by certain hedge funds, and they took and they actually act upon it, and then they didn't act upon it because of, they have you know private uh, information. It's all public available information. They mount, they they, they found it, identified it, action upon it in a collective manner. So technically, there's nothing seriously wrong about that. And then looking back on these stocks that maybe some of them did, but actually you know AMC and GameStop, they they didn't really go back to the two dollar kind of range. They they stayed at the reasonably high levels. You would argue. You know, maybe that, that, that after all these hypes and, and even after this, the spotlight of social media went away and these stocks retained their reasonable level, which is far from which they were before the whole thing started. So you, you can say there is some collective wisdom in that, in that process. And in the future, I, I was, I, I would, there's a new phenomenon called decentralized hedge funds and all that. I, I think that the way of leveraging decentralized uh, uh, and um, collective wisdom will be a way of conducting research and uh, running investment going forward. Excellent. I just want to remind the participants uh, who are all on this, uh, listening to this wonderful panel, you know, I'm learning so much uh, as I'm doing this. I have a couple more questions and it looks like the panelists are extremely uh, sharp. They know this industry very well. And so they're providing very valuable, useful insights. We might still have about 10 minutes or so for some Q&A sessions. So if you would like to on the chat room, if you have questions, comments, post them, and I'll try to curate them and add them to the uh, towards the end, okay? I encourage you to do that right now. Very quickly, I think impossible to have a panel discussion today on finance without talking about DeFi, uh, decentralized finance. And uh, Michael was the one who was uh, talking about it. And that's one area that kind of seems to Keep him as, as one of the very senior executives in the company in the uh, in a uh, traditional legacy institution that's kind of keeping him up a little bit uh, from the way he's talking about it. So I would like to have him say more about how he sees DeFi and what are the implications of DeFi. Are we too bullish on this? And I would like to know his reading of the market. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. I guess for the sake of uh, making it more interesting, I do have a balanced view, but let me try to deliberately take the more uh, bullish uh, angle of the argument. Uh, in, in my opinion, I think uh, DeFi, I'm extremely bullish on DeFi and crypto. I think crypto people often just narrow it down to a particular Bitcoin, a particular cryptocurrency. But the, the fact is that there is a the lot of cryptos and there's also evolution of cryptos into stable coins and in the future, <coughs> Uh, and some already like China is already existing, the, the central bank issued digital coins, a uh, digital currency. The, the, the point is that um, money will be digitized one way or the other. And through the digitization of money or value, if you will, it will 
um, sponsor or, or facilitate a, a wide range of financial activities that's currently done through the traditional financial institutions. Uh, with the digital currency in the future, they will be a, a mirror of all of that activities in, in a decentralized manner from the very basic savings and borrowing and lending and companies like Compound, the RV, then they're all you know, and payments, et cetera. All of these traditional bank facility process can be actually done very seamlessly and, and at a lower cost on the, on the DeFi space. And the more advanced, you know, Wall Street kind of activities, if you will, from trading, derivative trading, market making, you know, asset securitization through NFT and then securitization through the DeFi platform or even insurances, uh, you name it, basically anything that you do through the current way has a mirror in, in, the, in the DeFi space. And it's, it's growing rapidly. And perhaps the Gen Z and the millennium generations would have more personal experience and more optimistic outlook for, for that. I'm, I'm way past that age. But I start by through reading and through talking to people and forum and colleagues, I, I become very optimistic about the, this development. Another interesting angle is the development of metaverse. The fact that Facebook, you know, changed its name to Meta, it's not necessarily because of the, just because of the name of Facebook. It is really their vision of the future. And if you haven't seen the video that Zuckerberg presented uh, maybe two weeks ago uh, about what met, their vision about metaverse and then some early demonstration of what it looks like, it's really mind mind boggling. It's really out there, but it's yet and it's so attainable. I think the very fundamental of it is really the sense of presence uh, but the virtual sense of presence can be delivered so well uh, in the near future where it can replicate or replace or even enhance the real world experiences not just uh, people think of it as just uh, some silly games that the kids play think about your experiences of flying to hawaii or flying you know going to disney what is that for all of that is really just for experience you go to a concert live all of that is really for the uh, you know sense of experience and where, what if technology can deliver all of that and then even better than that, then, then you personally go there and, and people will take on it. And of course, to do that, the massive amount of a development, programming, you know, artist participation, all of that has to happen. And that's what's happening now. All the investment and money are flowing into the metaverse development, just in the hope that the future experiences can be a large portion of our future experience will be delivered and lived in that space as opposed to the real physical world. That's why I think the currency you spend there is most likely a digital way of money. It's not going to be paper bills or uh, <laughs> certainly not paper bills, uh, not even fiat money, perhaps. So that's why with all these things combined, I'm very, very enthusiastic about uh, DeFi and crypto. Sean, would you like to take a crack at that? Yeah, so I think, you know, I sure, I, I sure Michael's view of you have to kind of separate any specific coin from the idea of digital currency and a lot of the underlying technology that removes a lot of the friction that exists in the systems today, which can be of huge value, right? Both in terms of time saved, in terms of money saved. And the other point that I'd make is that, you know, we, we've touched on a lot of themes today around proliferation of data, um, ecosystems being combined, you know, with DeFi, it also gives a chance for those who don't have access to central institutions to actually, to, to become banked, right? And, and to gain access to kind of some of the benefits that come with that, which I think is incredibly important. It's also important that with all of these things, and, you know, Laura mentioned this on the Reddit example is, it's very incumbent on us to make sure we do these things responsibly, right? Because my fear with this is, is I think the technology is great and I think we're going to enable a lot of new innovation, a lot of which Michael touched on. But what's lost again in the Reddit uh, example is the number of people who lost a lot of money who didn't really know what they were doing, right? And we do, and we do have a lot of regulation. We do have a lot of rules to try and prevent that from happening because we don't want people who, to be taken advantage of. And so part of what I want to make sure of is that, you know, I think we, we want to be quick with kind of rolling these things out, but we want to make sure that we don't have people get taken advantage of. Because sometimes when you have that decentralization, you get speed, you get innovation. And again, I think those things are inevitable. It's, it's hard to fight against that. But part of the value of centralization, while it comes with some of some bureaucracy, it comes with some friction, um, it does give you a level of oversight that can prevent kind of people from being manipulated or taken advantage of, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge for us as a society is going to be, how do we embrace these things? Because they're coming, you, you can't avoid them, um, but do so in a way that we're not disenfranchising people. And, you know, the, the last example I'll give there that's that's very near and dear to the hearts of, of, of both the Thompson Reuters is, you know, access to information is great. Proliferation of data is great. But it makes things like the data and ethics of AI, it makes things like making sure that you don't have biases in your data sets and your algorithms all the more important. 
because as we start to rely on these algorithms, on these universes to augment kind of our traditional ways of doing things, you do run the risk of, of unintentionally introducing biases that disenfranchise people, right? So I think my bullishness on the technology is there, but I caution it with making sure we do it in a responsible way. Mm. Laura? Yeah, I kind of agree with both sets of, of points. It's funny, when I first started, I, I think I'd said this to folks a, a while ba back, but I was kind of more bearish like years and years ago because it was just a trendy word when it, this was like when it wasn't crypto, it was blockchain, right? So it was just like blockchain, blockchain. Everybody said it like it was the the fun word to say in bank meetings or wherever. It was just like the buzzword of the moment where it was said and, you know, like what can we actually do with it? I've been trending upwards to, towards bullish and honestly between uh, pre-call with Michael and now listening to Sean and Michael, I will say I'll just be bullish now. <laughs> worked my way from, from doing that to listen to what you are saying. Main things I would add, and, and they're kind of points that are a little bit across the board here to kind of tie to everybody else. Um, I was just at Money 2020. And um, what was really interesting is if you compare the boosts that were there, even three years ago to now, it was, you saw crypto everywhere. I mean, it was a consistent thing that was seen where, you know, several years ago, you would not have seen that. You might have like one or two in the baby little boost. These are like massive, huge boosts where it's clear that, you know, this is this is here to stay. Um, the other piece while there, we have a product called Indy, which is a, a gig economy bank account. What was interesting for us too, is that for the very first time, everybody that was asking if they were going to use the product was asking, will we offer a crypto option? That was some of the first time that that has been a predominant like ask for, of us if we were going to have that option, which is a bit telling on that space. But then kind of going back to blockchain, I think for me, I think one of the, the interesting plays that we have, which is, isn't the, the DeFi piece of it, but it's just on like the smart contracts. I think there is some really interesting technology there where financial institutions, others can really do some cool things in smart contracts is something that I know PNC is really, really focused on right now as using that technology for something kind of really cool on the banking side. Wonderful, wonderful. Really enjoyed the conversation. I, again, remind the participants uh, that they could post questions. We might have time for one or two. And actually, there is, you know, it's better that you post them on the Q&A. Uh, if you post it on the chat, that's fine. I will uh, look at that too, but Q&A is there. So feel free to post. I think we should be able to get a couple, one or two questions in. Uh, the last set of question I had was, you know, in today's world, Sean kind of briefly talked about it, but a lot of them bias and so on and so forth. So one of the things that we increasingly worry about, you know, of course, the biggest issues in the past few years have been income inequality, a lot of social issues, environmental issues, and Michael thinks of it as the ESG, broader sense of uh, issues uh, that need to be confronted with, and finance is such a critical part of the whole industry in creating it or moderating it. So I just wanted to ask your sense about as to all this technology uh, and potentially democratization in terms of investment, democratization in terms of giving loans, how can it impact on the ESG dimension? Any one of you, anything that you think is important or interesting, uh, feel free to mention and talk about it. I don't mind jumping in because there was a study I read recently around this that I, I thought was really fascinating. And um, it was talking about um, trying to look at correlations between income inequality and you know, access to banking or financial services. And they went country by country. And basically, you know, Sweden was at the top of the list because it's known as having one of the most even distributions of kind of income and not as large of gap in wealth. And when you look down at the data of the number of the people in the country that have bank accounts, for the richest people in the country compared to the poorest people in the country, the number of people that had an account was almost equal to one another. So there was like an even, you know, everybody had access to, so they weren't on their bank, they had a bank account. Compared to Indonesia, which had one of the largest kind of income gaps and income disparities, they were, the wealthy were twice as likely to have a bank account as the folks on the other end. So it's really, really clear that when folks are underbanked or don't have access to financial services, that that is leading or correlated somehow to, to that gap. And I just found that really, really interesting. And then in the same study, they were talking about how financial inclusion is also strongly in associated with lower um, inequality as well. So it's really clear that they're, the two are interrelated, that the more we can figure out how to provide financial services, whether that be a bank account, whether that be loans, whatever it may be, and tools to folks who are traditionally underbanked or non-banked, that can help uh, with that gap quite a bit. So that's wonderful. 
Great example. Uh, Michael, I'd like to uh, come a little bit about the broader concept of ESG. I think it stands for environmental, social, and governance. I think that the notion started by the United Nations maybe 20 years ago, but in the last four or five years has really catching fire on, on in the financial industry, particularly on Wall Street. I think of it as a very positive uh, thing that's happening in the financial industry. I'd like to share one interesting perspective, which is that often people think, uh, maybe mistaken this by with philanthropy or subsidy, thinking that if you, you know, bias the investment towards the, the, the efforts that promotes the social, um, social equality, maybe there's a cost to that. Maybe the, the bonds that it produces may be underperforming the, the normal bonds, if you will. But quite the, quite the contrary, what's interesting is that because of this movement, there's a huge amount of um, growth in terms of ESG-based funds and their revenue uh, looking for products to invest in. And that actually makes the green bonds, if you will, the ESG bonds basically perform, actually enjoy a premium, if you will. They actually traded at the tighter spreads than the otherwise equivalent to regular, regular fixed income bonds. And uh, there is a strong belief, not only because it's a good will, people wanted to do, that, to do that, but also people, there's a fundamental belief that the companies and business that put CSG as their priority will end up outperforming the ones that don't have that priority. So I thought that was a very positive development that's happening now. And coming off of that kind of a different angle where I think there's embracing ESG, I think is really important. And just the concept that it stands for and, and that, that sense of purpose. I know at, at Thomson Reuters, I know we have a very strong sense of purpose at, at the organization. And many people feel it's important that when you come to work, you are working on something that you feel contributes to the world in a material way. And the thing I've seen kind of as we've done a lot of recruiting over the last few years is that is becoming clearly more and more important to the next generations of, you know, in, in technology and engineering that sense of purpose and that sense of wanting to know that what you do matters and, you know, hopefully leaves the world in a better place than, than when you started um, really, really matters. So I also think that there's, you know, to, to play off of what Michael was saying, there's the strong customer demand. Like when I talk to our customers in one form or another, ESG concerns are, are showing up on their radar, which means there's a huge opportunity there to serve them. And, and, and that leads to financial gain, but also just to attract the best talent. I think if you're not focusing on these things, if you're not kind of, embracing it and leaning in as an organization, you're going to miss out on the best talent. And I think, you know, our industry is no different than others where we're a talent-based industry. And so I think it's, it's really important from that angle as well. No, that's, that's a very interesting uh, dimension to it. We still have about five minutes. There is a question. Let's see. In today's world, access crypto is highly dependent on access to tech and knowledge. What's your take on how it may, may be actually increasing the wealth inequality between people? having access to tools and knowledge is because of this presence of developing nations versus people who do not have access or even basic necessities in developing nations, let alone access to the internet, smartphones, or even education systems tools. I think the thrust of the question, which I think is extremely relevant is uh, crypto and technology access is becoming such a big powerful tool, but that's not evenly distributed either within the country or across countries. So how do you mitigate that problem? Is that is the point that they make things worse uh, before they get better? Quick, quick comment. I'm not sure if that's true, that the idea of cryptocurrency is actually making it more available, that the, fin the access to financial transactions more available to people who don't typically get access to the, you know, the premier banking services. And uh, in, in the less developed countries where you don't have a, a stable currency, it's actually providing you a, a good way of storing value i guess maybe more more stable than than your than your local currency perhaps so i think it's it's actually a democratizing force as opposed to further differentiating rich and poor by and large but i agree the extreme poor may not have the knowledge and mean of even accessing you know a phone but that's quickly changing i think in the very poor countries everybody they don't have a car but everybody somehow has the latest phone it's kind of strange and i think that just to kind of you know touch on something michael michael alluded to there is that those who don't have access to technology often don't have access to banking, don't have access to justice, don't have access to many things. And so there's a lot we can do to try and level that playing field more. You know, I'd have to look at the data to see whether this actually amplifies that or not. But what I would say is, is that this to me becomes a more solvable problem, right? To Michael's point is that infrastructure work to kind of roll out technology and make it make it more accessible to people is something that we can we can collectively solve if we have the will to do it. Giving access to justice and banking and these sorts of things and and stable currencies around the world is a much 
more difficult problem to solve because it, it has unique in, in implications in each kind of geography, right? So, you know, there's a short-term aspect of it, but it, it also starts to create a path towards a more equitable future if we're willing to kind of make the investment and kind of help, help get there. Yeah, um, I mean, I just kind of tend to agree with kind of the comments made so far on, on that one. I mean, I go back to the Indy example before, the folks that we're working on with Indy, where we get the question on the crypto, the initial target audience for our Indy product are um, mostly underbanked. It's a prepaid um, debit card for 1099 workers. So a lot of the folks who are getting this card aren't don't have, traditionally wouldn't be able to be approved for a traditional checking, savings, or other account. And so as we think about expanding that outside of the U.S. into some of these developing countries, we think the same thing with India or other countries of like, is this a product and a service that we can use there? And then when we add in the crypto piece, like I said, that was like the most common question, is there the ability to do this? So, I mean, I, we're kind of seeing that type of thing as well. I think the question is extremely relevant. I think it's something that uh, everybody should stay mm -hmm. focused on it. I think even in this country, if you kind of look at the infrastructure bill, I think a very significant amount is dedicated, I think $20 billion or something like that to broadband. I think, so when we think about the uh, information pipelines and infrastructure, uh, governments, if they divert some of their attention to that part of the process, I think it's also very good. I'm reminded of the example where I think the, uh, a lot, not along the same line, but somewhat similar to this, the Indian government, I think gave something like 200. So some of the, any kind of, welfare uh, distribution, which was being previously processed through layers of intermediaries prone for corruption. Some studies indicated something like 60, 70% of them never reached the customers they were intended to. And the government tried an experiment in which it gave free banking accounts. It, it forced the banks to give free accounts to people. And I think they it was something like close to 200 million accounts were opened and direct deposits were made and that completely directly reached these customers. And I'm also reminded of the M-Pesa example. Some of you might remember the M-Pesa as well, the initial payment system in Kenya, which was done completely through mobile phones, kind of using text messages as a de facto bank. And there is a study that was done by an economist who had actually attributed something close to about 1.5% in GDP growth in Kenya every year or to just M-Pesa. So I think the point is very important. I think maybe in some of these uh, broader uh, forums, it may be important to see as to how government is enabling this infrastructure and providing access to all of its citizens, I think might be important and powerful. I think we are just to the end of this. It's been a wonderful panel. I think Laura has just learned more about Bitcoins. She has turned positive and she is uh, <laughs> going to go out and buy some. Right? And I've learned enough about all of these things. And I've, Michael, I'm as bullish as you are, but my first, uh, Triced with uh, Bitcoin was in 2012 when I was in South America on a short vacation with my wife and I was telling people that we should buy this. So, my God, if you haven't sold it, you're building there now. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I, I said we should buy this. And so I couldn't easily find ways to buy that at that point in time and, you know, got around to it much later. But every cloud has a silver lining. If I bought the Bitcoin at that point in time, I wouldn't be part of this panel now. <laughs> uh, so, so my learning would have stopped. So from that perspective, life yeah. is short and it's a good place to learn. And I see Dave on the on the screen. Dave is one of the key players. Hello, uh, thanks for doing this. I think it's been an impressive panel. Any one of you, I want to say something. Otherwise, I think we are on one and on time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I also like to thank Laura, Michael, and Sean, and Kanan. Great questions. Great moderator. Thank you. Mm -hmm.